listening to The New Paris. I'm your host, Lindsay Tremuda. Turn on the nightly news, listen to the radio, or speak with most Europeans these days, and the topic on heavy rotation is the energy crisis. This is partly an outcome of the Russia-Ukraine war, as Moscow has suspended natural gas supplies in response to economic sanctions imposed by the West. As reported by Fortune magazine recently, the invasion of Ukraine started just after European nations decided to rapidly shift to clean energy and shutter nuclear power plants, which left them vulnerable to an inflationary shock when Russia cut off gas supplies this year. European governments are trying to diversify supplies and introduce measures to reduce demand and save energy. In France, we've experienced fuel shortages and high gas prices across the country since September and have been told by government leaders to do what we can to reduce our own energy consumption. If that means turning down the heat and wearing turtlenecks to stay warm, then so be it. And yes, that is really something a minister said. To go deeper on the crisis, how the EU is handling the situation, and what needs to happen to prevent further trouble for citizens, I am joined by Laurent Schmidt. Laurent is the head of utilities and European development for DC Bell, a renewable energy technology company. He's also spent years working for the European Transmission System Operators Association, as well as on grid innovation. As always, links to sources and articles mentioned in each episode are provided in the show notes wherever you stream your podcasts. Now, let's talk energy with Laurent. Good morning, Laurent. Thanks for being here. Good morning. Um, Let me ask you, because as someone who is uh, working in energy and specifically in renewable energies, what is going on in Europe right now? What what, what caused what we know to be an energy crisis? Yeah, so I think it's important to restart from a world energy system point of view at the the pan-European scale. So uh, the most of our energy system are interconnected, uh, whether it's gas or electricity. And so we need to look at the uh, European energy balance from a world perspective. There are really two phenomena uh, which are creating this crisis. The, uh, the most uh, uh, known one is the uh, Russian uh, invasion into uh, Ukraine and all the sanctions uh, which have been taken by Europe uh, to stop basically Uh, purchasing gas from Russia, uh, which raises, I would say, supply uh, issues into Europe because some countries in Europe uh, were largely dependent on uh, gas uh, from Russia, uh, particularly uh, Germany. And basically, it is uh, uh, too short time for this winter uh, to really uh, develop alternate uh, sources of supply. (coughs) There are some which get developed. So basically increasing uh, imports, LNG import from the US, increasing import from Norway and and so on. Uh, But it is really uh, uh, not enough uh, depending on the uh, energy demand. So here the uh, really the issue is the uh, supply and demand balance at at a European scale. So all one of the key questions is what is going to be the demand of energy of Europe for this winter? And that is uh, really depending on, on several factors, in particular the uh, uh, weather uh, severity, how cold is going to be our winter. Uh, they are basically the coldest it is and the more energy we will need to heat uh, our industry, houses and buildings. And, and of course, it is... Uh, right now an exercise of uh, uh, predicting uh, our risks related to uh, to this weather and of course we uh, if we have a weather which is uh, rather uh, um, uh, hot uh, during this uh, winter we we may not have too much of a crisis if temperature are going very low uh, then we will suffer supply uh, issue on the gas side mm-hmm. But people don't know that there is a second, uh, often don't know that there is a second uh, difficulty right now, which is the nuclear situation in France, uh, which is uh, related to the low availability of uh, nuclear power plants, uh, which is below 50% uh, for the moment. And that is because of what? And this is largely because of uh, uh, basically... um, I would say issues, technical issues found uh, onto some of the um, nuclear uh, uh, piping. And so the need to reinforce uh, some of this piping with welding. And this was imposed by the nuclear authority 
onto EDF, plus the fact that the COVID has actually really constrained and complexified the uh, uh, the uh, maintenance program uh, mm. of all these uh, nuclear power plants. So as without going too much to the technical detail, we also have a supply risk in France on electricity uh, because of this low nuclear availability. And we've heard we've heard the government say things like, you know, we may have power outages, they're going to try to minimize them, or they will um, impose them in companies where they're, you know, doing heavy, where there's heavy machinery and, he, you know, heavy energy or dense uh, production facilities. Um, and we also know that France has sent a lot of gas to Germany. Um, so regarding those two issues, you know, there are things that are very specific to France. Um, and there's this idea of European solidarity among these pressures. So what is the ultimate risk for France? I mean, the is, is it more sort of the, I mean, because historically w winters are getting warmer and warmer. You and I are based in Paris, which is perhaps a bit um, of a, a skewed perspective because right now it is October and it is spring like weather. So, you know, but that could shift, but other parts of France obviously get a lot colder or could get a lot colder. So what is what is sort of the ultimate risk for France specifically? Is it the nuclear issue? So basically, yes, the nuclear issue is one of the difficulty because uh, we need nuclear, particularly during uh, cold winter uh, periods, uh, because this is the period where the uh, maximum of reactor are operating. So normally we run around uh, 80 to 90 percent uh, of our nuclear portfolio during this time. Uh, during cold uh, uh, conditions. So the key question is what's going to happen uh, if this nuclear is not available? Uh, we've seen recently uh, also some uh, some strikes happening into EDF uh, nuclear, uh, which is which may delay uh, further this, uh, this maintenance. So what may happen if the nuke is not available is the grid is, the electrical grid is interconnected. So what's going to happen is the uh, foreign countries being UK or um, uh, Germany or Northern Europe uh, will come as a solidar solidarity and will supply electricity to France as a first measure. Uh, but the difficulty is, is this electricity is going to be largely produced out of gas, uh, gas generation, uh, particularly at the peak time. And so we may end up into a scenario where the, uh, the gas difficulty of Germany during these peak periods uh, may actually... Um, uh, curtail some of the loads uh, into the gas sector, and particularly the industry, while in the same time we have constraint on the electrical sector in France. So here the key question is whether solidarity will be kept uh, during these peaks uh, across Europe and whether basically there will be sufficient gas in Germany to produce electricity and ship it back to France uh, during this uh, cold condition. Mm -hmm. If not, basically, what's going to happen is the uh, electrical system is a system which is governed by physical laws and not by uh, laws voted in Parliament. And so what, what happens very simply is if you don't balance uh, supply and demand in real time, you would see the grid to collapse. And of course, that, uh, that no one wants this to happen because it would be a major disaster uh, for our society. So what's going before this to happen, uh, uh, grid operators have started to take measures uh, which are known as a, a load shedding uh, strategy. And this is what we are currently discussing right now and where we hear RTE informing basically consumers that in case of uh, extreme cold situation, uh, we may see a shortage of power into certain industries and houses uh, during the peak time in the day. So if everything goes well, that would be maximum for two hours mm. in the morning peak or in the evening peak. So if grid operators do that work well, it will not end up into a complete blackout. If it ends up in a complete blackout, that would be a, a disaster because this would take time to restart the system. So, you know, one of the things the government has been saying is, well, we just need to have uh, we, we can't crank up the heat this year. We have to wear turtlenecks and make sure you're turning out the lights. I mean, this kind of commentary, is this even useful to get consumers to understand the, the scale of what's happening? Yeah, that's, uh, I, I share your, uh, your skepticism about uh, this kind of messaging. Uh, 
I think we are a bit uh, having too many wishful thinking in France about uh, people going to do a major uh, in-kind effort, I would call it just in-kind effort, in case of such situation. And uh, of course, uh, it is important to have people aware of the importance uh, to be efficient in this period. So, for instance, if you have an EV like me, not to charge uh, during this extreme peak is, is relatively easy because you are an EV as storage. Uh, but I don't think personally that it will be enough uh, if the winter really uh, gets uh, gets cold. And I think it is uh, also um, uh, not sending a, a clear enough message uh, to people to prepare about blackout in their home for several hours uh, during these uh, winter periods. What I also am frustrated about the fact that in the majority of countries outside France, a grid operator prepare uh, basically uh, uh, demand response uh, schemes, uh, which are actually going uh, beyond wishful thinking, which is really uh, incentivizing a certain consumer for uh, 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 reacting uh, to an extreme uh, event, being a cold, a cold spell, and where there would be a reward uh, given to this consumer for their uh, demand response, similarly to what happens already into the industrial sector. So I, I think we also fail in France for the moment into establishing these safeguards, and we uh, surely bet onto a warm winter and about uh, uh, efficient, I would say, minor energy efficiency measures, which I have my doubt will go uh, further than 5 to 10% uh, impact onto the peak. Yeah, actually, you bring up uh, those percentages. A recent uh, news report said that uh, so far with the measures, I think mostly corporate and uh, governmental, of lowering their own energy consumption, there's been 14% less consumption in gas and 5% less in electricity, electricity, but that's mostly corporations. And then you have this symbolic dimming of the Eiffel Tower, which, yeah, you're shaking your head, which no one can see, but I can see. Um, I mean, is that lip service? I don't even believe it's the most draining source of energy in the first place, you know, and is that good that we should be showing, you know, Russia, you know, you've managed to have us dim our our cultural beacon. You know, is that just optics? Yeah, it, it is a bit of uh, cosmetics, uh, I must say. Uh, of course, if you aggregate this to a scale of the entire France, it has some impact. But if I scale it down to uh, to an individual houses, and if you start to impact uh, your lights, which are largely based on LED light bulbs, you're going to impact less than five percent of your uh, power. And uh, very, uh, you may also um, uh, you may also actually impact the lifestyle of uh, of consumer a lot because if you ask them to be in the dark uh, during two hours in the morning in the evening, it is actually very impactful for. Uh, a very, very low impact, uh, while uh, there may be uh, uh, other smarter measures. So what also I would like to challenge is the um, fairness of these measures. Uh, on, on one side, uh, the grid operator ends up paying very high amounts uh, to large industries, and that's why they actually are looking at this seriously. Uh, while they are only counting on to uh, wishful thinking measures, uh, and uh, in-kind measures uh, from consumer, which, again, I, I think this is important, but I wonder whether it's going to be uh, sustainable if we have a cold spell over several days or weeks, and if people will be happy to uh, shut down their uh, lights every morning and evening uh, over a period of two, three weeks uh, during the winter. It's going to, it's going to be uh, some fun for a few days, but I have... Uh, mm. I am pretty sure that people will get some fatigue into uh, into doing this after a few days, especially if it gets cold into the house. So, mm-hmm. uh, so, so I, I I I really think we could do much better uh, into uh, into this environment. Um, I, I saw a recent uh, graph. I think it was in one of the major newspapers showing where the heat cons- or heat and energy consumption, uh, how it falls in Paris, and it is very heavy in Western Paris, uh, where there's obviously bigger apartments, uh, historically wealthier residents. Um, You know, do you feel like maybe the risk is also that the working class is going to be 
the most heavily burdened by this because they're the ones who are already looking at their monthly budgets and, um, you know. Okay, so it's uh, again a fairness question. Uh, what's going to be the uh, rules for managing these rotating load sheddings? Uh, these are very secret rules hidden to everyone uh, and managed by the grid operator who is actually controlled by the states and I suppose they are going to uh, they are going to uh, first shed loads which are far away from uh, Palais de l'Elysée <laughs> and they, they'll end up into uh, I would say less and they'll try to shed less and less critical load and and um, I would say opposite I would say uh, more and more critical load while the burden uh, gets higher on to so again, I'm not uh, criticizing. At some stage, uh, if the measure, if the situation gets very tense, we need to do that. But what I'm arguing is the best way to shed load is actually to encourage people to save out of demand response pricing schemes, which reward people for doing a certain effort. And the best way uh, to encourage people to do it is according to this scheme and people are smart. So they will be able to define whether they have they have PV with storage or, uh, or uh, other flexible loads. They will be willing to help the system while others uh, and maybe uh, poor people have very limited loads, but their, uh, their light and their electricity heating mm -hmm. is extremely crucial for them because right. their house is, is poorly insulated and I guarantee you, after 30 minutes of blackout, they are going to feel uh, the cold temperature. So, so these so, incentives, is it mostly tax tax breaks? No, they, they, they are actually, uh, we call them demand response uh, incentives. So, so basically what, what it consists of is you, you try to predict what's the average behavior of a consumer. And basically you measure uh, the behavior of the consumer during an extreme peak. Uh, which is basically measured through the ECOWAT app. Mm -hmm. And basically, you just reward for the effort, which is the difference uh, between the average behavior and the effort done by the consumer. And uh, and you actually give a true incentive. So that means you drive people potentially to buy a battery or to really rethink uh, how they're going to consume. So for instance, in my home, I just bought a small battery to make sure that my uh, gas heating can run during the... Uh, during the uh, electricity uh, outage. So, so these are very, very basic things, which I think no one talks about. And, and this, no. is, uh, this is really a pity. Um, before we get into, you know, the work that needs to be done in renewables, I wanted to just mention that we, you know, I'm sure foreign listeners might have heard about the fuel shortages that we had in France in recent weeks, and there were striking refinery workers, you know, demanding higher salaries. And this is partly because there are these oil and gas companies making major profits from, you know, surging energy prices. So, what is happening there? And will we keep seeing these sort of spikes in uh, gas inavailability? Or was that strictly re related to the strikes and not the broader issue? Yeah, I think this is a broader uh, economical issue. And uh, uh, generally speaking, what we see is uh, some, uh, some activities in France are very concentrated to a point that uh, basically a limited number of work workers uh, have a very strong uh, power to block uh, the uh, the uh, economy in France and the refinery worker uh, are a good example. I'm not judging whether they are right or wrong to ask for this salary increase. I'm not able to to judge what I what I see is they are definitely better paid than an average uh, worker in France. And I would say it is the same for operator of nuclear assets. It is the same for operator of grids and so on. And I, I think uh, what we will see in the future is the uh, the need to go into a better uh, a resilience, uh, 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 more resilient system in the way that uh, future system are going to be uh, more di dispersed, uh, uh, is going to be more distributed uh, in a way that uh, consumer are going to be able to self-sustain in case of a major incident into large infrastructure. I think this is the way we need to, uh, to think in the future. And that's going to make us resilient, of course, to difficult strikes periods, but also to a war situation. Uh, when we look at uh, Mr. Putin's attack into Ukraine, 
His focus right now are precisely on two large concentrated energy infrastructure being new assets, hydro power plants and grids. And I think we need as a, as a, as a, as a society to rethink how the resiliency of our uh, society is organized. Well, in like many areas of life, people uh, get very comfortable and don't actually want to shift the way we exactly we consume, the way we do things. And so it's sort of these like minor changes or improvements but there you know the question is like you say will it be sufficient and that leads me to obviously the renewable discussion because that's the business that you work in um what what is happening in terms of uh getting europe ready for renewables and what what do those renewables look like actually what form do they take okay so Europe has always been at the forefront of developing renewable and uh, I consider our European system as basically a, a benchmark for uh, other continents when it comes to renewable integration. And the European Commission has done excellent work into defining a trajectory before the crisis, uh, which was defined as part of the uh, clean energy pack package and repower EU um, uh, policies uh, after the COVID uh, situation. And at that time already, uh, renewable what was at the front uh, of the strategy simply because renewable becomes today the cheapest way of producing electricity into our pan-European system, even cheaper than nuke uh, today. What has happened is basically because of this invasion and this extreme situation on gas, as what I was reporting before, uh, it has been an, a further accelerator uh, to that uh, to that situation. And, and this Repower EU plan has now added uh, uh, layers of uh, uh, mandates to accelerate renewable de uh, development simply because every kilowatt or kilowatt hour of renewable which you bring online in the system, particularly during the peak, is going to be a saving on gas molecule consumption, uh, I would say 30 or 40 percent of which could uh, uh, would come normally uh, through Russia. So the more uh, we invest and accelerate into renewable and the more uh, we become independent. And so I think this has really become a, a strong target. What, what is going to be the renewable? It's going yeah. to be largely uh, wind and uh, particularly offshore wind on one side, because it is uh, there, there are very good resources in Northern Europe in particular. And it's going to be rooftop PV. Uh, there is really a, a rush onto a rooftop PV uh, with an entire rethinking of uh, a performance uh, um, uh, re uh, regulation for buildings, uh, where the direction is to uh, mandate installation of PV on every building. And very important is to encourage self-consumption of PV by the building. And that goes back uh, to my previous comment, that the more self-consumption you have, the less dependent you are on the, from the grid. And, 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 and the better you are in case of an extreme weather event I was uh, just referring before. So that goes into uh, domains such as adding storage with PV, adding uh, uh, bidirectional charging of EV with PV, and really accelerating. And there is really a, a great potential. We are talking about potentially around 40 million uh, houses, uh, uh, 40 billion houses, uh, which, which are to be... Uh, uh, to be uh, to be equipped uh, in uh, in in the coming uh, uh, 10 15 years in Europe uh, with that kind of installation so how does this get decided then does france have the ability to make mandates specific to france or does this need to be decided on a european level so the this is a complex uh, discussion happening between the uh, european level and the countries uh, so that's in the uh, brussels uh, terminology we call it a trilogue and and that's where basically brussels gives the direction and the states uh, have to decide what is their way of implementing it uh, depending on the resources which are available and obviously every uh, state has a different strategy uh, between germany and france we see the difference between gas versus nuke uh, which has been an historical difference. But what the Commission is trying to do is really to, uh, to provide an incentive for renewable in particular into uh, uh, installing and deploying renewable wherever possible and as quickly as possible. And, and that's where the difficulty is because the grid again is, going, is starting to, to be congested, is starting to be a constraint. So we have to be smart in the way we integrate this renewable in the future.
And how would you say France uh, in particular, or even on a, on a more specific level, Paris, how, how are these energy sources, these renewable sources getting implemented or are they getting implemented at all yet? Yeah, so, so they, they are existing, uh, existing renewable uh, uh, implemented, definitely. So if we are looking, for instance, the case of rooftop PV on homes, uh, I think uh, overall we have around 10% of homes which are already equipped uh, with, uh, with sort of PV on the roof. And uh, so, so that, that really goes as a natural development of the ecosystem. What is really new is that there is a time for in terms of speed and quantity to be, uh, to be installed given the new mandate given by the Commission. So it is now really a rush. And this rush is going to be complex because the grid and the energy system is able to absorb and integrate a certain level of renewable. But the more we put into the grid and the more difficult it is to stabilize the grid. So that means we need to be smarter in the way to operate the grid and in the way to organize interaction between renewable and grids. As, a, as an example, I will just take the uh, very simple example of a PV system uh, on a roof in a home with storage. Uh, today, the storage is not capable of supplying the home in case of a grid fault. So that means if we have a blackout, uh, the home will stay with this PV and storage, but not operating as an example. So it's going to be strange. Solar will be there. Storage will be there, but the home is not going to be powered. And when you say storage, what are we referring to? So we are referring to a battery, uh, battery okay. uh, basically simply uh, put in the home to, uh, to stabilize and, and make sure that the solar is exported at the time when the energy system uh, really requires this. Okay. So that's, that's just a very simple example to show uh, the, the kind of change. Uh, moving forward, what's going to be very interesting and it's going to be a game changer is the electrical vehicle. Uh, the electrical vehicle will come in every home as, uh, as storage on wheels. So if you combine well the photovoltaics with your electrical vehicle, you're going to be uh, self-isolated through your PV and uh, EV during few hours. You can huh. use the power which you have in your EV uh, to supply the grid. As, as a matter of fact, I'm uh, right now in, uh, doing an installation in my home, which I think I will be able, in case of a blackout from RTE, to stay independent for two or three days, just using the electricity from the uh, battery in my car. Wow. And, and so the electricity, you know, that's the beauty of the physics of electricity, provided you put the right <coughs> regulation in place and you let basically consumer to develop, uh, I would say, innovative mindsets uh, uh, towards uh, this future. So the future is not about nuke everywhere. The future is about combining nuke with renewable and being smart in organizing that integration at the uh, consumer level. So the company that you work for, uh, which which focuses on one aspect of renewables, is that yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, do you are you consumer facing, or do you put pressure on government? Uh, and influence maybe their their thinking on these issues. So, so we are multi-sided. We are two-sided. The first side is the uh, consumer. So we are consumer-centric, and so we we offer something which we think will be revolutionary in the energy sector, a bit like the iPhone ten years ago in the telecom sector, and that's going to be what we called a home energy station. So that's going to be a power station in the home. And that's going to combine charging of the car, discharging, electrical, uh, basically feeding from the uh, PV uh, of your rooftop, and then also uh, your storage. The other side of the story, uh, which we are uh, developing, is making sure that this, uh, this device has a smart interface with the grid and being able to participate in demand response program, being able to respond to price signal, and being able to curtail in a smart way uh, smarter than a load shedding uh, when something happened into the power system. And, and I think this is really the future. I think the future is about engaging consumer, making them, uh, I would say, in a way self-sufficient mm -hmm. during these extreme periods. Again, we are not talking about replacing the entire grid and so on. We are talking about supporting the grid during these extreme periods. And I think what we see today is the grid on its own is not capable anymore to support and guarantee the, the, the power supply during these extreme periods. So if, if we were to leave listeners with uh, sort of 
best practices, even even if they can't, let's say they can't afford a battery uh, that's big enough or strong enough to support their home in the case of a blackout, what are some of the little things people can do in their homes, the changes they can implement that will actually hopefully make a difference? Okay, so very good question. So first of all, think about what would I do if I have a two hours a shortage of power in the morning for seven to nine or in the, on, or in the evening for seven to nine. So these are the two critical uh, uh, periods. And so here what you just need to think is what are the electrical equipments which I'm able to unplug to be able to, um, uh, to support the system so that's the minimum. But also if I have a blackout in my home, which is likely to happen if there are cold situation, how am I going to sustain during these two hours? So here the question is, I will not be able to use electrical uh, equipment in my kitchen. I will not be able to use uh, electricity from my heating uh, devices. So a uh, hair heating, uh, heat pump and so on. And if I have a gas, uh, a, a gas heating equipment, I will probably have gas because it's very unlikely the gas and electricity will have shortage mm -hmm. in the same time. I won't be able to actually heat with gas because my electrical boiler, uh, my boiler, my gas boiler is actually also using electricity. And so here, what, as an example, I've done in my uh, concrete, my personal case, I've just bought a, a, a kind of small battery, which is able to supply me with my internet box, with okay. my uh, boiler, uh, gas boiler, which makes that, and with one or two lights, which make that I can stay during a few days with two hours outage of power, still continuing to do some work and do some minimal heating in my house. Okay, so these are the typical example which people need to think. Of course, you know, you need to know a bit about electricity, but how am I going to behave in case of regular two hours shutdown of electricity in my house for several days? That's really one of the critical mm -hmm. elements. If people have an electrical car, uh, of course, one of the questions will be make sure that your electrical car is charged during the night and you do not try uh, to charge during this period. So these are very, very simple uh, uh, questions. And On in the theory, having more, having food, shelf stable food available uh, that doesn't necessarily need to be cooked. I mean, that's, that's, that, could, that could be another issue. Yeah, so, so the freezer, I think, can last more than, uh, if we don't open it, uh, right. can, can go over six hours. So I don't think there will be issue here. Uh, I think you will be still able to drag food from your fridge and uh, probably is going to uh, cool a bit. But again, it's not a big issue. The, the problem is you won't be able to heat it. Right. And so, for example, as, as what I did myself, but it's just an example, I, I just bought... Uh, a plancha, a gas plancha, which I put outside, <laughs> which which is totally independent from my system, which I can cook basically food in the evening out of gas without electricity from my kitchen. So so this again, uh, we could heat sandwiches, we could do several things, cold sure. food and so on. But I think what I worry about is if it continues over several days, and uh, it happens when I was young, I lived in Quebec uh, during two years. And I, I happened to witness a shortage of electricity in my apartment for two weeks. Oh my gosh! And this is this is really uh, this is really uh, uh, shocking in how cold it becomes into the apartment, how much you depend on the food and the heating of the food, and and it was the the bad news is that if it happens, it's also very cold outside. So you don't enjoy going out. You don't. Uh, right. So you need actually your your home as, as kind of uh, as, as kind of an environment because you feel protected still uh, into uh, into this environment so if you have uh, if you have wood uh, you you better start your uh, wooden uh, wood, wood place and uh, fireplace and so on so so these are the very simple so i think people need to think okay during this two hour what i can do this winter and then on midterm, I really rethink uh, whether they can still rely and trust this big infrastructure. And I would really encourage them to uh, think if they have good roof to put PV, if they have an electrical vehicle to rethink the way they use their electrical vehicle, mm -hmm. or storage and so on. That's the midterm direction, which I, which I see happening. By the way, 
the installation of PV in France, I think, have more than tripled in uh, in less than six months as a result of uh, COVID, as well as this fear okay. about, about the energy crisis. Well, let's hope people are listening and paying attention and, and wherever they're getting their information, they realize the long-term effects of of, of issues like this and, and how the geopolitical uh, influences our day-to-day -day life. Uh, Laurent Schmidt, thank you so much for joining uh, and walking us through this. Thank you. I hope nothing will happen. That's <laughs> what I've been very... Uh, 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 very um, uh, negative in some of my statements, but again, in order to best prepare, it's better to think about the worst case and not, scenario and not prepare for the best. And my fear is for the moment in France, we mostly prepare for the best. Yes, I agree. That's the show for today. As always, thank you for listening, subscribing, and sharing with friends. You can find all previous episodes of the New Paris podcast wherever you stream your podcasts and on World Radio Paris. If you're enjoying these conversations, please consider picking up a copy of the New Paris book or my recent release, The New Parisienne, from your local booksellers. Until next time, à bientôt.